But yeah, this is your interview. You're free to run it as you, as you wish. And hopefully I'll do my best with my answers. Perfect. Uh, see, as an interviewee, you have, a, you have the right not to answer a question that you might uh, deem inappropriate or badly structured or purely nonsensical. So it is completely up to you what questions you answer and what you don't answer. Okay. okay. And, uh, blockchain. Yeah, very, it's a very kind of, it's a very good topic of interest between the people who actually know about it. But altogether, I think it's a very niche topic. Yes, I mean, it's, it's interesting, like here in, in Cape Town, there's quite a big following for it. I mean, we've got um, that guy called Vitalik, who created Ethereum. He's coming to Cape Town uh, next weekend. So, oh, very good. Yeah. Are you going to attend it tomorrow? So, yeah, so I'm definitely going to the conference, going to hear what he has to say. And, uh, yeah, so we, we're definitely a hot spot when it comes to this technology. Um, but I think, yeah, that's something about South Africans is we... We like to see ourselves very much as the leaders of tech entrepreneurs. I mean, you just have to look at Silicon Valley and I mean, Elon Musk is South African and that guy yeah. who, who owns that mega hedge fund or investment fund, what's it called? Is it called sequential capital or something like that? Um, his name's Roloff Bertha and he's also a South African an actuary as well. South African actuary heads up you know, one of the biggest investment firms in Silicon Valley. So, so yeah, so that proud to be South African and part of this tech culture. And yeah, we've definitely taken blockchain and we're happy with it. I mean, we've got coffee shops dedicated to this stuff and regular meetups. So we like to think that we know the technology. Of course, it's very complicated and it's progressing at a rate that unless you're a computer scientist, it's difficult to keep up. But mm -hmm. um, as long as you can keep a, like a grasp of the basics and you know, the philosophy around it, um, it's amazing at opportunities that you can see, you know, where this can be applied specifically in the realm of finance. So, yeah. Exactly. Yep. Uh, just give me 20 seconds. I don't know why I just decided to uh, play up now, but it's starting. So, uh, and then I will proceed my, with my first question. I'm going to start with the first question and I'm going to, uh, if I'm uh, saying the question too fast, please stop me and I'll uh, say it again. Okay. So my first question to you is uh, current applications of blockchain technology mm -hmm. that might have an impact on finance, especially in the field of taxation. Okay. So look, I mean, the way I see blockchain is that, you know, one of its core things is the fact that it's uh, transparency. You know, that is what blockchain is giving us. It's giving us transparency and it's giving us security. And this has been phenomenal when it's come to, to payments, especially economic transfers over the internet, because now what you have is as soon as you make that transaction, it goes through the security protocols and the transaction is deemed valid and you can't do something called a double spend attack, which is what people were doing mm -hmm. with old financial systems. You know, they would tell someone, oh, I'm paying you with my, my bank account. And then as soon as the person gets proof, they're like, okay, great. And then they quickly cancel it and they can get the goods and keep the money. So mm -hmm. blockchain was, was brilliant in, in doing that. Um, when your question now applies to say tax, it, it gets very interesting because one of the things with Bitcoin was that it was created as a decentralized system, whereas mm -hmm. tax is a funding mechanism for a centralized uh, government system. And it's quite nice to maybe just before we progress further to take like a, just a step back and look at what exactly tax is, because you've got some people who deem tax as a slavery. You know, they come up with this big statement saying, you know, government's taking a portion of my labor without my consent. You know, this is a, a form of, of slavery. Of course, I think personally, that's a little bit ridiculous. Um, I, I, I understand, I understand like everybody, wants to pay as little tax as possible and get as much government um, you know, benefits, whereas government wants to try to re receive as much taxing as possible and provide as little benefits as possible. But at the end of the day, in working democracies, you know, it's the citizens that are voting governments into place. And we want tax because it's a way that we can all collectively you know, finance the government in order to do certain operations. Ooh, sorry, that is my phone ringing. Okay. Should have put that on silent before. Um, so no, so as I was saying, it's, you know, tax is something that citizens 
throughout, you know, a lot of us might not enjoy paying for it, but throughout the course of history, we've come to this social contract agreement with governments that, hey, we want to pay tax in order to get uh, various benefits. Um, of course, so we, yeah, we can maybe say that tax is a good thing. Where it becomes questionable is how much tax to pay and what method should we use to, to apply tax. Um, and I mean, here, here in South Africa, I'm not sure how it works elsewhere in the world, is we have quite an efficient tax system. I mean, in fact, I think the South African tax system is one of the best in the world in the sense that it does work at, you know, if you do something wrong, SARS will be, you know, knocking on your door saying, hey, you have to pay your tax. But one thing that we've done quite well is we've introduced fuel tax. And what's great about that is people who then use government services, like let's say the road, um, they're then paying the most tax for the person who uses it the most. So the more you drive your car on the road, the more tax you're going to pay through fuel. Of course, that assumes that all roads are equal, um, which of course we know are not the case. Sometimes in the mega cities, the highways are of a better quality than say the roads in the rural areas, in which case a good tax has been introduced as having a toll gate. Um, so these introducing tax this way and taxing things the most efficient way possible is important for citizens. Of course, South Africans get very angry, and this is a place where I do see blockchain helping out, is that we feel that government is inefficient with the spending of its of the money that it collects. In South Africa, you'll often hear people complaining about corruption or the misallocation of funds. And when you have blockchain and transparency and everybody can see those payments, then that's going to make it difficult for corruption to occur. Imagine if you're, every time a government official made a transaction, people would say, hey, you know, why are you receiving you know, a large sum from a you know, corporate individual? And then you know, the next thing you know, a rule is introduced that helps that said corporate. You know, people can then ask questions and journalists will have a, you know, make their job a lot easier. So I definitely see the, the aspects of blockchain, the fact that transactions are transparent as being a very critical thing. So whether we use blockchain or something else, whatever that something else is going to be, it has to incorporate that transparency that Bitcoin and the blockchain has so graciously given us. So, yeah, I think that's, that's uh, one of the great you know, potential applications of, of the technology that is already in place. We really have that, yeah. Perfect, perfect. Uh, my next question is, uh, most of the top tier firms, and when I say top tier, I'm uh, referring to Deloitte, KPMG, EY, mm -hmm. anticipate uh, blockchain technology's potential in tax to be major and revolutionary. Do you agree, and what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, it's, it's interesting you, you look at the, these accounting firms. I mean, they basically have built their business around, you know, the accountant, the audit process, and also as having tax uh, experts. Because, like I said, going back, people want to pay as little tax as possible, um, and we want to try tax in the most efficient way possible. So what government does is it's not just like a general tax, oh, everybody pay, you know, $10 a month to be in the country. Various activities are taxed differently and all these things. But as soon as you start introducing weird and wonderful rules, um, you're going to get these specialists, these intellectual people that KPMG and EY and all these accounting firms employ that are going to discover loopholes. You know, so, oh, if you put your assets in a trust, you're going to get a tax benefit. Or, oh, if you set up an offshore business, you're going to get a tax benefit. And what the government has to do is, or where it gets a little bit irritating, instead of them going back to the drawing board and saying, okay, let's try to figure out something else, they just keep on adding more and more rules. And these rules start getting confusing, which the accountants are actually quite happy with because it makes their skills even more in demand because now the rules are so complicated, you need these accountants. So I think tax has, has been very beneficial. The whole process has been very beneficial to these accounting firms because it's given them a lot of business. Where, where I'm quite interested is you look at this blockchain technology and especially where it's going. And when I mean by where it's going, if we had to go from, say, you know, Bitcoin introduces transparency, but then you've got these platform coins like Ethereum, which can, you know, they talk about the smart contract. We could start seeing smart transactions. And what I mean by smart transactions is that when you now send people money in the future, you won't just say, oh, you know, here's $10. You'll say, this is $10. And you'll say, this is in payment of a salary, or this is a donation 
or this is for the purchasing of bread. And depending on what reason you give, what the, the platform or blockchain technology can automatically do is apply the right um, tax amount. So if it's bread, it can be 0%. If it's salary, it can be stepped according to how large that salary is. If it's a donation, it can be a slight discount. And then what happens with that is tax can be done immediately and not have to be done retrospectively or you know, every six months like how you know currently doing. And I think that's gonna be really critical for the economy because not only are you taking away all the stress or this financial burden, you know, I don't have to no longer pay Deloitte to do my tax because it's done automatically, but all that economic data that the government's going to be getting, it's going to be seeing, okay, how much money actually is going to bread, how much money is going to donations, how much money is going to these various things. And I think that's exciting. Of course, of course, you know, we can't, um, we can't be naive and, you know, some people will maybe start paying salaries and you know, saying that it's bread in order to enter that zero uh, percent tax gap, or, or you know, will we'll maybe lie on the smart transaction, and that's where I, I see you know maybe artificial intelligence um, or some machine learning techniques coming in to try and pick up on that you know illicit behavior. So if an amount exceeds the normal cost of bread, you know, that's going to be a little bit of a red flag, and then you know, maybe the government can can investigate. But coming, I guess, back to the question is, um, yeah, I do agree that the technology eventually will be embraced because of the benefits that it is promising. Um, of course, now there's, there are a few hurdles um, and a few difficulties, uh, but in the future, I can see that those things will be ironed out and the benefits will outweigh the cons and yeah, blockchain will become part of our payment mechanism. Perfect. Okay, so uh, my next question is, uh, I feel like I might be repeating myself at this, but uh, just bear with me. Uh, what scope of potential does blockchain technology hold in your opinion? What is the most immediate cost benefit and earliest adoption application available? So no, look, this, this is a good question because I mean, it's, it's very easy to talk about the ideal state, you know, the state when blockchain is fully implemented when adoption has been completed and you know bitcoin is saturated in the market everybody understands it everybody's using it then you know fantastic we can get all these these great benefits but the problem at the moment is well i see there's there's two two big hurdles with bitcoin at the moment is it's inefficient with you know in forms of electricity you know you need like an internet connection and you need all these uh things but also it's complicated. I mean, you've got, you've got to remember that the average person in the street, when they did their schooling and everything like that, they were taught mathematics with coins and, you know, like, okay, um, I'm not sure about how the denominations are in, in your country, but in South Africa, you know, you've got 50 cents, 20 cents, 10 cents, 5 cents. And the teachers would use these as tools to say, okay, if you bought something for 75 cents, what coins do you need? And money and education especially at an early age played such a critical role together because it was such a lovely way to do uh, practical problem solving that people mm -hmm. kind of you know were ingrained with this is what money is money is a technology that is issued by the central bank blockchain comes in and it questions that whole idea it kind of says no no you know money is anything that we agree is a store of value or it's anything that we are prepared to, to use to facilitate trade. It doesn't have to be issued by a central authority. To get people's head around that is going to be a massive, massive hurdle. And I think a lot of people are going to resist. They're going to say, this is too, too difficult to understand. Uh, specifically, I'm talking about older people. So like people like our parents who are so used to the old method. You know, Bitcoin comes in and they you know, they're going to be wary. They're going to be wary. I mean, already they battled to, to use normal apps on the phone. Now you want to digitalize the entire you know, payment process. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, and, and this is something that we've seen, like in South Africa, we've got a company called SnapScan, which allows people to make payments using their mobile phone, you know, scanning little QR codes. And, and it's very efficient and it's a great thing. But you mainly only see what we call the hipsters and the young people using it because any technology... I mean, old people are going to have a, a bit of a resistance to. 
So I think that's there's, there's the practical adoption problem. And then, of course, like I said, there is that technology inefficiency. But I think that one, it's, it's interesting. I think both will be solved in time. You know, the old people are going to be replaced by our generation who's going to be comfortable with using it. And technology is improving at a rate that we will be able to do these things faster and maintain that same level of security that makes blockchain so trustworthy. So, but yeah, I would say that those are maybe two of the hurdles, but they will dissipate in time. Yes, um, <clears throat> perfect. Um, so my next question is, uh, what changes will it make to your profession in terms of personal, cultural, and structure of the organization? You know what, I think it's, it, it's, it's an interesting question um, in the sense that I think it will make people think about money a little bit better. Uh, specifically, like I say, blockchain, the whole great thing about it is that there's this transaction history and it's transparent. Uh, people, I think, well, maybe not people directly, but I think apps will develop that, you know, you'll download this app and it will look at your past transactions and it will draw, you know, pretty visualization of how you're spending your money. And people will be able to see, oh, wow, you know, look how much money is going into entertainment, look how much money is going into food, oh, look how much money is going into education. and Yes, I know certain people do that already, you know, they, who do their own books and they keep all that accounting stuff. But a lot of people don't do that. And I think this technology is going to allow these third party apps to be built on top of it that are going to provide, you know, details with people. And it's going to help people to spend uh, a little bit more wisely. You know, people are going to save a little bit more and there is going to be that culture change. I also see that people are going to start becoming maybe forced to be a little bit more ethical. You can imagine if all your transactions are transparent, um, you know, and your wife can go to you and be like, Oh honey, you know, what, what where, where are you spending money at, you know, two o'clock in the morning, uh, you know, at this, this area where there's a strip club, you know, there, there will be these things where before cash, cash is silent, you know, cash, you can just do your thing and no one, there's no paper trail when it comes to cash where once money becomes completely digitalized, there will be this trail. And yes, I know people say, oh, you're infringing on privacy. For me, privacy is not that important. Um, for me, I see transparency as being better because yes, people can't maybe get away with doing whatever they want to do, but that also means that government officials can't get away with you know, doing corrupt activities. And I think that when you look at the big picture is more beneficial. So yeah, I think there will be there will be a shift in, in culture. Um, and like I said, it'll, it'll make us maybe a little bit more ethical just because the chances of us getting caught out are going to be much higher. Um, and it is going to give us a bit of a better overview of our fin financial position and we're going to spend money better. Perfect. Oh, I actually agree. <laughs> yeah, very true. Um, what are the potential obstacles you see are there any institutional barrier, regulatory, other stakeholders resistant to change? Yeah, I think this is, this is something, again, it, it comes with, you know, most technologies, when you initially introduce them, there is a little bit of a resistance. Um, and I think the reason for that is you look at new ideas and you look at threats, like valid threats. Both of them introduce chaos in the short term. The difference is that the new idea hopefully creates better structure in the long term, whereas the threat, you know, it's just chaos all the way through. But in the short term, a new idea and a threat are kind of seen as the same thing. They're both causing chaos in the short term. So what we'll see is you will see people who are against Bitcoin, who are against blockchain. They will call it scams. They will call it, you know, disruptive technology just for the sake of being disruptive that it's going to push us into this anarchy position. And a lot of the times they've got justifications because there are scamsters who are using Bitcoin, you know, to run their business. I mean, ICOs was a classic example of how people just took the money and ran. And it did kind of hurt the whole image of, of Bitcoin as being a new technology compared to just say a threat that's coming in and, you know, ripping everyone blind. So, I do see a lot of this pushback and this is even something that we're seeing here in, in South Africa. Um, and I mean, I get a little bit annoyed because you look at our South African reserve bank and they're like, we have to introduce all of these regulations because of financial terrorism. 
And I'm like, what do you mean financial terrorism? I mean, in South Africa, especially a country like, let's say, South Africa, we don't really have terrorism. You know, so when they start talking about, oh, the point of this regulation is financial terrorism. And what I mean by regulation is they're saying that all these blockchain um, exchanges need to have, you know, know your customer policies. Everyone needs to be uh, FICA. Their details need to be given. There's this whole convoluted process that they want to try to put in place to prevent financial terrorism, where I'm like, if this was truly trying to be regulated to safeguard the market and all that, the regulation would also include that exchanges have to keep certain reserves and, and other things that we see in, you know, the, the derivative markets and, and other things like that. So I think yeah, at the moment we are seeing pushback. And like I say, it's because I think the people who are in charge of these institutions um, are old and are seeing this new technology as being, having similar properties as a threat, you know, blockchain will cause a little bit of chaos in the short term. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, already in my, my own life, it made me question what on earth is money. And you can imagine that's, that's, I'm someone who studied this thing. Um, when that starts hitting the public, it, we don't know what the short term effect is going to be. We can see, oh, ideally the long term effect is going to be better, but in the short term, mm -hmm. there might be chaos. There might be inefficiencies. And I think there will be, people in those institutions who will want to push back. Also, also, I mean, and maybe this is more of a sinister or more of a skeptical look is one of the things blockchain promises to do is to decentralize power. And mm -hmm. you might say that these institutions have a hunger for power and therefore want to block it because they see this thing as a threat to their, their stronghold. Of course, that's maybe being a little bit too cynical of the financial institutions. Um, I think that they, yeah, I think that their purpose is to try and, you know, push the economy forward rather than just to hold into power. But that is, yeah, a view that we sometimes see being discussed is that, yeah, because blockchain wants to decentralize, that's why there's being a pushback, this kind of resistance fight for power. Perfect, perfect. I noticed you mentioned uh, disruptions in your answer, and uh, my next uh, question follows disruption. So my next question is, do you recognize any dangers or disruption in when uh, uh, talk in relation to blockchain technology itself? So, so yes, I mean, like I say, in the, the short term, we, we're going to be seeing some chaos. We're going to be seeing some chaos. Um, people are going to be questioning what exactly is money. Um, and I mean, to, to a certain degree, we've already seen this manifest itself. The whole blockchain uh, bubble that was in, you know, end of 2017, early 2018, people panicked. They were like, okay, maybe this is the new money. And people threw in, you know, life savings into this technology only for that bubble then to burst. And then people got burnt. People lost a lot of money. So I think we've already seen some of the dangers occur. Um, ICOs are another classic example of, of a danger where they came in, person promises, I'm going to create a new wonderful technology that's going to change the world. And people are like, well, Bitcoin did. So, you know, maybe this random stranger on the internet's going to, he's got a pretty website. He's got this confusing white paper. Here, take my money, make me rich. And he's promising, you know, times 20, uh, you know, returns. This person then takes all this money. And I don't know, let's, let's pretend he, he's, he's an honest guy. And he first looks and he says, okay, I've got all this money. Let me actually try to solve this problem that I said I was going to do. And he maybe starts, he starts the problem and he realizes, wait, this was a cloud in the sky idea. There's no way I can do it. Um, and look, I'm accountable to no one because people all around the world have given me money in the form of Bitcoin. It's irreversible. You know, do I slave away at a problem that I cannot solve? Or do I buy a yacht and sail into the sunset and have fun? And that's what we saw happen with ICOs. That's why I think Facebook, Google started banning that, those, um, you know, those adverts which kind of stopped the demand for, for Bitcoin. And one thing that we need to realize is, especially Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, all of these things, there's a constant supply getting pumped into this market every single day. You know, every time block is mined, coins are being released into the system. And there's this constant supply. Yes, it halves every so often, but you know, for periods, there's this constant supply. So if suddenly demand has to go down and you're still getting in the supply, price is gonna start coming down. As soon as that price starts coming down for a prolonged period of time, people start getting that fear, there's uncertainty, and they start selling their coins, which what it does pushes supply up even more, reduces demand, and we have a little bit of a spiral um, or a market crash, which is what we saw. 
And because it wasn't regulated um, in the sense that there was no government, because sometimes what happens in, in our markets is if that starts happening, government sometimes steps in. We see China does this and they just start buying up stocks just to try to prevent the crash from happening. Because Bitcoin had no central authority or no government backing it, it went into complete uh, free fall and we saw the, the thing almost wipe out. Um, so yeah, so I think there are dangers. There's definitely, it's not like, you know, don't put your pension money in, in behind this thing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, uh, but I think all technology is going to come with, with its possible risks, even AI, machine learning. I mean, things learn by failing, so it's going to fail before it gets things right. And yeah, I think society is kind of still failing, but we're learning how to apply Bitcoin and blockchain to our economies. Perfect. Um, my second last question is, uh, this is from the South Africa point of view, what is the time span for adoption in South Africa? I know you've told me already that they've started adopting the technology, but when I say time span, how long do you think it'll take for South Africa till a blockchain is fully integrated into society? So look, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question, especially you know, in South Africa, because there's the one view, like I said, where South Africa, we have some amazing, amazing entrepreneurs and some really, really intelligent people who can, we, we have the ability to implement it, to you know, change the RAND, put it all on the blockchain. The South African Reserve Bank is testing the technology. They are working with some entrepreneurs um, and there are some amazing you know, Bitcoin blockchain ideas coming out of South Africa. So that kind of suggests, you know, we're going to get this technology before anybody else. We're smart. We know how to use it. and We can see the problems that it can solve. On the other hand, we have a government that has got much more pressing issues at the moment. Um, because South Africa, we are a country with such high inequality. It's more important for, for the government, especially in getting votes for the next election, that it is seen addressing issues of poverty and you know, pushing money towards education, um, housing for the poor, making sure that just basic human needs are in place, such as sanitation and internet and these type of things. So you, know, you look at governments, they've got their hands full with just doing normal tasks, uh, you know, normal things that governments need to do. To now come to the government and say, oh look, you know, there's this new technology that could completely you know, like, yes, it's going to be efficient, um, but hey, you know, it's going to take time. It's going to take money to, to invest in this. Uh, South Africa, the, the South African government is going to say no. They're going to first say, let's wait and see other governments put it forward. So I could see mm -hmm. um, smaller economies such as Malta, Mauritius, Bermuda, maybe mm -hmm. implementing the technology first. South Africa mm -hmm. will take a step back. We will wait. We will wait. We'll see how they do it before we change it. because. This is one thing that we, we see just in actuarial science, I mean, in corporates, is legacy systems are very, very difficult to replace. Um, and I mean, this is at a company level where an insurance company finds it very, very difficult to go from the systems they were using 20 years ago to this modern day technology. In fact, we call it boiling the ocean. That's how difficult we, we say these projects are. So what they do is they normally just use a little bit of the technology in various uh, area. So you still have the legacy system and then you add these new components on top. And I think that's what will eventually start happening in governments is it will be very rare to see an entire financial system being replaced and put on the blockchain, even though that's more efficient, it will give us more data and you know, it will allow progress to accelerate. I think we will slowly see these things coming into place. So it will first be the biggest um, and most efficient things that they'll do first before it slowly trickles down into the rest of the economy. Um, so yeah, I think South Africa, it depends on, on how other countries do. Like I say, if Mauritius adopts it and it benefits them, then the government will say, okay, let's go on board. But our governments, they, you know, they're not gonna venture into the unknown unless there's sufficient evidence that the benefits are gonna be there. Especially since, just like I say, South Africa, we've got all these smart people who are for Bitcoin, we also have a bunch of smart people who are against Bitcoin. Um, and like I say, as soon as you've got the debate, you know, having both sides, government will rather stall um, or be patient rather than jumping in and getting its fingers burnt. Um, Cause then the citizens are going to be upset. They're going to say, you wasted all this money on a tech project where you could have been building more houses for the people. 
So yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, that's the reality of things. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So my uh, last question, last question is: uh, Any informed opinion? Where do you think blockchain technology will be in the next twenty years? I know the time span I'm giving is kind of very far fetched, but uh, mm -hmm. next twenty years, where do you think blockchain technology will be? Well, I mean, this this is the thing with with technology is that we need to understand that it is progressing at an accelerated rate. So I think. Oh yeah, I'm quite optimistic. I think in the next 20 years, we are going to see, maybe not necessarily in, like I say, in South Africa, we're going to first wait and see other countries. But I think we're going to see some countries adopting this technology, taking the plunge, saying, hey, let's go for it. Um, I'm going to see the hardware improving drastically so that the inefficiencies of blockchain um, is going to be reduced. We're going to see these payments being made instantaneously. Uh, we're going to be seeing the security protocols getting even better. And I think it's just going to be, like I said, I'm optimistic. I see that the technology side really, really accelerating uh, drastically. So in 20 years time, I think it's going to be, it's going to be a wonderful thing for the economy. Blockchain is going to be implemented, maybe not everywhere, but I think the countries that do adopt it, that do see that, you know, that increase in hardware capability are going to benefit drastically from it. And then, yeah, it was kind of like, you know, whenever there's a big monetary change, you know, first, there is a little bit of a hesitation. One country does it. People see, okay, wow, that actually works. And then these mm -hmm. things spread like, like wildfire. And I think central banks all around the world will start adopting it. Um, but yeah, so 20 years, it, it is a fairly short period. It is a short period of time. Um, but like I say, one thing that we've, if you look at history, is that we are advancing in our technology at an accelerated rate. And mm -hmm. I know it's dangerous to extrapolate, but if you had to, if you had to, it does paint a very pretty picture of the future. So I think in the next 20 years time, people are going to be a lot smarter with their money. There's going to be a lot less inefficiencies. And yeah, we're going to be using this economic advantage. We're going to tackle climate change and all the other problems in the world. So overall, I'm optimistic. Um, but it's because, like I said, I've been looking at the past data and life has been getting better. Not necessarily for everyone. But as a whole, mm -hmm. technology has been getting better and everyone slowly does rise. So yeah, 20 years time, it's going to be, it's going to be a good place to live. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's the end of my interview questions. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you for your like, uh, participation. Thank you. No, no. And, you know, absolute pleasure. Yeah. I only, uh, to be honest, I only uh, got um, acquainted with the topic of blockchain of us about nine or 10 months ago. Okay. And I knew the difference between blockchain and Bitcoins. So, you know, most of the people think blockchain is Bitcoin, you know? Yes. You know, yes. It's because people are not educated. Right? It's one of the things that, you know, kind of needs to set some education on because if it's going to be the next big thing, it, you know, people need to get familiar with it, you know, need to know how it works and everything. So, but no, I, I decided to do that this for my dissertation because the topic really interested me and, uh, and the more I'm going uh, going into it, you know, kind of uh, thinking of pursuing, you know, further research into it after my um, undergraduate degree, Sylvia. Okay, and uh, I, yeah, I thought, uh, you know, your opinions were like your thoughts and your informed um, opinions were very, very good. And it kind of made me uh, see blockchain from a different perspective because people I've interviewed, they're just, uh, not necessarily you know, the perspective uh, aren't that, you know, different from yours, but they're uh, talking about, you know, the uh, implementation and the structure and the political infrastructure you know, in Ireland. But it's nice to hear, you know, a view in South Africa where the technology has already, you know, developed further away than, you know, Ireland, in Ireland. So it's brilliant. Brilliant. And yeah, thank you so much. No, no, I'm, I'm really happy to have helped. And yeah, I hope all the best with, with the project. And yeah, let me know how it goes. I do know that we, yeah, there's, I know the Zoom calls do normally cut out after 40 minutes. So if it does cut out just straight away, it is because of that, not because I'm being rude and <laughs> just hitting the. Yeah, the and if it's gone by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks. You know what? If you were, if you were not, and I'll take you for a few points, you know, for helping me. Thank you. Like, you know, thank you so much. I don't even know how to pay you. No, no, you know, I love Guinness, so if I'm ever if I'm ever there, I'll I'll hit you up. Never in Ireland, you know your first five points are on me. 
Fantastic. You thank you so much, Jay, and enjoy thank the rest you so of your much, And yeah. I wish you the best. And I'm fo I've started following you on LinkedIn, and I'm going to be spreading awareness uh, of your YouTube channel, of your LinkedIn, and your smartness. So yeah, <laughs> thank you so much. No, no, thank you very much, and yeah, have a have a great evening. And yeah, I'll send you this re this recording soon. Perfect. Thank you so much. And I'll uh, you know what? Once my dissertation are complete, I'll send you my dissertation. Thank you. I like that. Thank you. Enjoy the read. Thank you. Fantastic. Cheers, eh?